Welcome to Debt Talk Podcast with me as your debt doctor, Ripon Ray. The topic I'm going to speak about with my panel members is minority communities and financial struggle. Britain may have a minority prime minister. This does not necessarily mean we're expecting major improvements to the lives of majority of minority communities in Britain. Poverty rate among this group in London is 38% compared to the white population 21% according to Trust for London, an independent charitable foundation. As the cost of living crisis unfolds during winter, I'm expecting financial situation of this community to worsen. To explore ethnic communities and their financial struggles on Debt Talk podcast, I have a number of panelists from different backgrounds who are experts from structural inequality and health, debt, and no doubt poverty. Near to the end of this podcast, I'm expecting them to give top tips to my listeners on the precise topic to ease pressures as winter unfolds. To help me navigate today's subject, I have Professor Patrick Vernon OBE, who has been campaigning on minority communities on many different levels. Muna Yassin MBE, who has spent over 15 years in the debt advice sector, where consumers are mostly of ethnic minority origin in London. She is CEO of Fair Money Advice. And finally, I have Helen Bernard, an expert on poverty. She is Associate Director of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation and Research Policy Director at Pro Bono Economics. For those who are listening to Debt Talk and you want to share your experience or expertise on Debt Talk, or maybe you want to listen to a subject that is of your interest, you can get in touch with me on Twitter, your Dr. Debt, or email me, ripon.ray at yourdoctordebt.com. Let me start with Professor Patrick Vernon, OBE. Patrick, you started a campaign against discrimination and most importantly around the Windrush scandal. Most recently, your focus has shifted on health inequality within the context of minority communities. What are the broad range of issues that minority communities have experienced and are experiencing leading up to the cost of living crisis. Uh, Well, thanks for inviting me onto the podcast. Um, I have to say, I've always been involved in health inequalities even before I got involved around the whole issue of the window scandal, because um, if you look at my uh, my career, the work I've done, I've worked in welfare rights. I used to be a manager or a citizen's advice bureau uh, in South London. Uh, in Wandsworth and a lot of people from black and racialized communities were really dependent on advice around maximizing their benefits, around housing benefits, uh, issues around uh, insecurity around work. That's when the kind of concept of zero contracts was slowly being introduced by a number of, uh, uh, of, of employers. And then I've, been, I've worked in the wild health and the that we know the relationship between poor health, housing, education, and wealth, we know that, and uh, and actually the health and equality gap has been widening the last 22 to 30 years, to be quite honest. Actually, it's been further exacerbated because of COVID-19. Um, and also, um, when we had the coalition government came to power around about 2010, they've introduced austerity. We've had austerity, really, for the last um, 12, 13 years in Britain. The cost of living crisis is just another extension of the austerity that we were all experiencing. Because in the early days of austerity, it was, there were major cuts uh, in the voluntary sector, uh, particularly from a whole range of grassroots groups that were delivering stuff on the ground, helping people to cope with the, the impact of inequalities on, on uh, racism. Um, and um, I used to run a charity called the, um, the Atka Trust, and we actually ran a campaign around about 2011, 2012, on the impact on, 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 of austerity on black and racialized communities. And what we did, we did a freedom, freedom of information request to all the 146 local authorities to find out what cuts they were making 
And did they do a quality impact assessments on those cuts around black and racialized communities? The vast majority didn't actually. So we, that was already happening literally 10 years ago. Uh, and also, if you look at the amount of money that's, that the public sector, particular local authority, have, um, have lost in funding from the central government, it's probably worked out into the trillions. Uh, all this ha has led to increase in poverty uh, as well, because obviously local authorities, NHS, public sector employ employers are the biggest employer in any deprived neighbourhood, in any deprived um, community. And with the mass, with the introduction of zero hours contracts, it's been very difficult for people to accumulate wealth just to just live on the breadline. I mean, work done by the Running Beach Trust, uh, others over the years have highlighted this poverty inequality gap. I think the difference now with the cost of living crisis, where it's obviously it's had an impact on fuel bills in particular, um, has meant that more and more people will go into the poverty line, more and more families. We've already got the highest number of families in poverty already uh, in the Europe. The, that figure is going to get worse. And uh, my fear is, um, and when DWP were introducing cuts in disability benefits, there were a number of documented cases of people committing suicide linked to those cuts. I'm not trying to say that because of the cost of living crisis, there'll be a link to people think about taking their life, but a lot of people will be under a lot of pressure of survival uh, over the next couple of years to come. Uh, but actually for people, black and racialized communities, this poverty, this the cost of living crisis has been a continuum for all of us anyway, uh, the difference is the cost is going to get bigger. You talked about costs getting bigger, you talked about austerity, you talked about cuts in public services, and of course, when it comes to health ramification due to changes within the I suppose, disability benefits. But within the context of minority communities, those communities also have other burdens, don't they? I mean, historically, if we look at it, what we have seen, we have seen how minority communities had to undergo structural racism. If you remember Stephen Lawrence inquiry not many years ago, stop and search is rampant. Also, I know you talked about health and education, but how those things do you think uh, impacts communities on the whole? You know, as it has an impact on people's expectations and aspirations and what they think they can achieve, and that's part of the problem we have. Uh, is that all these factors? I mean, if I remember uh, two years ago, a report came out by Tony Saul to recognize there's no structural racism with a figment of our imagination. And, and what was quite the, the report was widely discredited because uh, it looked at it didn't look at all the relevant key data sets around health and inequalities. Um, and poverty and exclusion and the impact of racism. There's a growing evidence base, but it's been like this for the last, for the last 30 years now of the impact. I mean, COVID-19 exposed it all. We all knew this uh, anyway, but it further exacerbated that. Why, in terms of the disproportionality of black and racialized communities by the COVID, because they were in low paid jobs, not getting necessary PP equipment uh, as well. So it's, so to me, the issue of cost of living and crisis has always been an issue. I can, my parents, they came to Britain as part of that winter generation in the 1950s. There was austerity then. There was cuts then. I mean, not cuts, but there was austerity. You know, the people weren't paid the same wage as white workers in the factories back then. You know, so when people talk about this ethnicity of gender pay gap, there was a, and back in the day, there was a kind of a, a real pay gap because of that racism, discrimination. It, it had to require changes in um, race relations law and equal pay act for us to get the same degree of parity but a lot of research work done and I, I'm, I am a, I, I'm linked to the Centre for Aging Better we did a piece of research work last year where if you don't build up generational wealth um, particularly in your pension pot and other things um, it means that when you get older later on in life you will experience people of colour will experience more experience of poverty and discrimination and exclusion because if you've been discriminated and you've been in a low paid job for many decades and your pension's not that fantastic and you've got inequalities 
um, your health. You may be suffering from diabetes, um, stroke, um, you know, certain long-term conditions, um, uh, and which has an impact on your your morbidity. And with these combined long-term conditions, it means that you're you're not earning the money that you need to have a decent quality of life. That's why it's important that we have the role of the NHS, the role of basic services are important, but they're under a lot of pressure. So the cost of living crisis is symptomatic of a deeper issue around inequality. So if you look at the rich list that's done by the Sunday Times every year, the, the actual health, the wealth gap is getting wider. The 1% of people that run Britain, are, their income levels and their wealth income levels are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, you mentioned about um, the prime minister, he's probably one of the most richest him and his family, their family, are wealthy, they're rich. They are completely immune from the cost of living crisis in many ways. And so it's important when the, the budget, which is meant to be coming quite soon, needs to really reflect the need and aspirations at the same time of people of, racial, of black and racialized communities. Uh, because otherwise we give the impression that the only way you can be successful, successful in Britain is to be a multi-billionaire, which unfortunately that's not, in the gift of most of us, even if we wanted to. Just to pull out a bit more, so in your opinion, what issues need to be resolved in order to really bring out the best interest of minorities communities in Britain? Well, I mean, it's short of redistribution of wealth, which I can't see happening <laughs> in this media, but actually the budget could play a key role. The budget needs to reflect that. The budget can do stuff around uh, the way where there's a tax where does taxation limits start, the national insurance contributions, tax credits, a whole range of tax uh, allowances to support people. Because what's quite clear over the last 10, 15 years, more and more people are in are dependent on working credit. There are people are working, but are required some, subsid some, some subsidy from the state to keep them in work. So we are subsidising employers. So there, and more and more people are caught up in this and it's a different type of poverty trap where people are working, but they're just making enough money just to keep themselves going. And we know there's been a massive explosion in um, the number of food banks run by a whole range of organisations up and down the country. That's going to continue. And um, one of the key things that we need to look at is that if we were able to spend trillions in a short space of time during the height of COVID, on um, now we now found that, that most of that money was actually inappropriately spent and some of the products from the PP equipment were not actually fit for purpose. We need that same level of injection of wealth of money to support people in this present moment in time. Well, let me get Muna Yassin to this discussion. Um, Muna, um, you've heard what Patrick has said around austerity, poverty, health inequality, and disability, and no doubt also, I mean, it's kind of, kind of, he also made it quite clear how even having a minority prime minister really isn't going to help unless you look at uh, issues of distribution and redistribution. What are your th thoughts on this? And uh, do you agree with what Patrick had just said? Hi, Rippon. It's a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. Um, I absolutely agree with what Patrick's raised. I think there are multi-layered issues. Um, and I think one of the areas that obviously I'm focused on is around debt and income inequality. And I think some of the um, issues that Patrick raised around structural inequalities and how that's exacerbated within minority communities, I think is fundamental. One of the areas that we also recognise is that actually mental health and the increase in suicidal ideation that we're seeing within the death advice sectors has massively increased, not only in the austerity years, but also during the pandemic and through obviously this cost of living crisis that we're, that we're in. Um, as organizations, we're actually having to think about how we support our advisors through that process. Um, obviously making sure that there's training to be able to support individuals that are in distress but also how do they deal with the, the level of um, horrific stories and um, situations that they are being faced with um, and ensuring that we provide the right support to them. So I think for me, there is a massive mental health issue that's linked to poverty and um, debt specifically. And I think there is something around ensuring that our communities are not left in destitution and where we are today, sadly, 
with the level of food bank use that's rising rapidly, um, I think we are at a stage where we are at destitution or very near to destitution for many, many people in our, our communities. I mean, you talked about destitution, you talked about mental health specifically, both within the context of advisors, as well as individuals who are finding themselves in financial difficulties. But if you had to kind of go deeper into it in a sense of looking at those who are knocking on your door and asking for advice, in what way would you say the minority communities need a different from wider population? Um, that's a very good question. I think the key thing to say is debt impacts most in the community in very similar ways. So your basic needs are not met, your impact on your well, well, mental well-being, anxiety and stress and family relationships, and obviously your wider physical and mental health. But there are other inequalities and issues that be, make the issue more um, exacerbated and more magnified for our minority communities. So we do know that people of colour and our black and minority communities are more likely to be in priority debt, more likely to have a low income, more likely to be in insecure work. Could you explain what priority debt is? So priority debt is a debt that effectively has a uh, stronger consequence for non-payment. So typically that would include your council tax, your rental, your mortgage, your utility bills, um, and anything that has a significant impact on non-consequence of payment. You're, typically, people think that actually not paying your credit cards or your, your loans is, is more impactful. The reality is if you don't pay your rent, you could be evicted. If you don't pay your mortgage, you could lose your home. Um, if you don't pay your council tax, you could effectively be imprisoned um, in very rare situations. Um, but I think the key thing is just recognising that our minority communities tend to be much more impacted by some of the social security changes that have happened over the last few years. So we know that um, changes to the social security system have been racialized. There has been a focus on larger families uh, with the child limits that we've seen in place, uh, the bedroom tax, etc. And as Patrick mentioned, many people on low incomes are therefore then dependent on some subsidy. Um, and the reduction in that subsidy has had a huge impact on our minority communities. Um, do you see whether there is an interlink between, let's say, um, those individuals that you're seeing to give advice and also uh, gaining access to financial services being difficult due to the nature of being uh, part of uh, a minority community? That's a great question. And I think that's something that's not explored enough. I think there's some work that's being done around in the Running Me Trust um, Colour of Money report actually really highlighted that really well during the pandemic. And I know that there's lots of research and there's some work that we're doing with partner organisations to look at this. So one of the key things that you'll find is that the needs of minority communities are not taking into consideration around some of their spending habits and their, their commitments in the credit profiling and the credit scoring process, which means that sometimes they are penalized when applying for credit in comparison to the wider population. So for example, uh, remittance payments, having a commitment back home and making that regular payment is not seen as a, 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 a sign or a worthiness of credit in comparison to other commitments that other people make. Um, and also savings clubs and, and informal saving clubs that minority communities use are not recognised um, and cannot be added to people's income as part of other investments that other communities have. So I think there's something around the, the credit industry and the financial services industry really understanding the, the behaviours and the needs of minority communities and then designing products that fit those needs to ensure that our communities are able to kind of increase their, their, their credit worthiness and, and their asset building, but also their, their access to financial services, mainstream financial services. I mean, I just want to go back to you mentioning um, prior to debts, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but um, local councils are recovering council tax arrears by getting bailiffs to recover council tax debts. Now, uh, what are your thoughts um, in current times where we have high inflation and, uh, of course, cost of living pressures? How do you feel about um, 
this impacting minority communities even more? So having mentioned that research shows and data shows that minority communities are more likely to have priority debts and council tax is one of those priority debts. Just by having um, councils collecting in that way, you are more likely to be impacting minority communities. I've never been a fan of using a sledgehammer to crack a nut, which a bailiff enforcement process is very much like. You are adding additional charges to communities and people who are already facing um, very stressful situations with uh, collection processes that feel archaic and very, very out of 21st century, considering the ways that we could be supporting people that can't pay. And I think there's ways that local authorities can work with their local debt advice organisations um, and ensure that people access the support that they need to be able to come to an arrangement that's suitable. I mean, you are a CEO, a CEO who is of ethnic minority background. Do you think your charity can meet the demands of the cost of living pressures? So I think it's important to stress that the cost of living pressures are affecting not just individuals, they're affecting the charity sector, the local authorities. So th there isn't a part of the population that hasn't been affected. Um, and I think the more that cuts are applied to the public sector, the more the pressures and demands on the third sector will increase. So I think there is a, regardless if you're a, a community embedded organization like Fair Money Advice, um, and where you are seeing that higher demand, if you are a public sector organization, you will be struggling um, with the level of demand and the cuts that are being applied. So I would, I would urge funders and I would urge um, decision makers and policy makers to think about where they can provide targeted funding within this cost of living crisis to support organizations, but also ensuring that there are strategic partnerships between smaller organizations and larger organizations. Um, community embedded organizations usually are the first point of call in a crisis. So during the pandemic, uh, it was faith organizations and community centers that were really mobilizing and supporting people. Um, so how do we use those networks to ensure that we're supporting them through the cost of living crisis? And how do we ensure that those organizations have the uh, capability and the support to be able to deliver those services meaningfully? You know, do you think um, Rishi Sunak being, I guess, the um, first ethnic minority prime minister in Britain would make much difference to ease the burden for minority communities in Britain? I think it goes deeper than one individual. I think we have such structural issues that Patrick outlined beautifully um, that have been highlighted and people have been working towards and will take a lot more than one individual to solve. I think there are things that we need to, as a community, ensure that, is that people who are being affected by these policies are at the table, helping design those solutions are helping amplify their own voices and ensuring that they are part of that solution rather than having things done to them. But I would also urge our politicians and our leaders to think about actually the impact of their words and the narrative. And so we've seen what's been happening with the, um, the minority um, um, effect on the asylum discussion that's happening now and, and uh, what's happening with the Home Office. And obviously we haven't learned nothing from Windrush, clearly having these conversations. So I would urge our leaders to think about the impact on their words as well. Well, let me get um, Helen into this. Um, Helen, you've heard what Muna has said. We've learned nothing from the Windrush, but of course uh, we are still in the process of exploring in terms of the precise issue. So from your thought, based on what you've heard, what's your, Gut, inst gut instinct. Um, so yeah, I mean, I agree with everything Muna and Patrick have, have laid out. I think one dimension that's been very much on my mind is, so as you started off saying, we've got much higher poverty rates among several ethnic minority groups than among the white British group. And probably the biggest driver of that is racial injustice in the labour market. So when you look at all the stats and research, 
we've got higher unemployment rates for some groups, particularly Black Pakistani and Bangladeshi groups. And that is linked to, so there was some research done in 2019 uh, by Nuffield College, where they tested out sending job applications in, which were exactly the same in terms of experience, qualifications, all the rest of it, but with different names on them, names that were associated in people's minds with being white British or from an ethnic minority group. And in Britain, somebody who would be assumed to be from an ethnic minority group would have to send in six applications to get a call back for every one that somebody who was assumed to be from a white British background had to, had to send. So direct discrimination is alive and well in the labour market. But then even once people get into work, we've still got some really pretty big pay gaps. And again, when we look, when we've done research, when you when you look at, say, if you take two men who are both graduates, have the same level of education in the same region, working the same kind of job, on average, a black worker is going to be paid about 17 percent less than a white worker. So this kind of injustice throughout the labour market means that people's incomes are lower. So you've got higher in work poverty as well as more people out of work. And that feeds through to wealth, as you know, people were saying earlier. So it is people from several black and minority ethnic communities have far less accumulated wealth to transfer to their children, which then obviously opens up all sorts of opportunities if you've got that family wealth behind you. Um, and then that's compounded when you look at housing. So one of the biggest drivers of poverty is housing costs. And what you see in the housing market is that people from most black and minority ethnic groups are more likely to have to be paying a third or more of their income into housing compared to white British people, but also are more likely to be living in damp, overcrowded, unhealthy homes. So these are two you know, really fundamental ways that inequality is just baked into our systems. And it's largely because of those things that social security becomes more important. Because if you are systematically on lower pay, paying a higher rent for a less good home, you need that help from Social Security more. So then when we saw a decade of cuts and freezes to Social Security, that impacted people from those groups far more than white British people who were more likely to be paid better in work more consistently with lower housing costs. So those kind of all those dimensions really mean that people are held back from achieving what they want from having a decent life from being able to pay the bills even and end up in more debt because of all these things you recently published a book want the publication clearly reflects on the impact of um William beverage and your book pretty much reflecting on what has happened since so what is your understanding so far so I think when I look back at this I think it's undoubtedly true that the kind of the post-war welfare state that Beveridge helped to get set up, that has achieved a lot. I think we shouldn't take away from that. Um, and you see particularly things like pension of poverty, which used to be incredibly high, was halved over the last 20, 30 years. And there's other things like, you know, we haven't got mass unemployment anymore. We do have a basic level of social security that most people can access. In education, most people end up, you know, kids leave school able to read and write and do maths for the most part. So it's achieved a lot. I think though the conclusion I came to was that what, we, what we've got is still very much that post-war settlement and actually modern challenges have changed a lot. So it's no longer meeting the challenges we have. So, you know, just one example, when Beveridge was setting up his uh, ideas around social security and employment support, his focus was on how do you get rid of mass unemployment? These days, actually, as we, we've all been saying, the problem is more about poor quality work and insecure jobs and jobs that don't pay enough than it is about having lots and lots of people unemployed. And you can see the same in other things, you know, the education system is pretty good at getting kids to a basic level of education. It's terrible at helping adults retrain for jobs when the old industries are disappearing and you need to get skilled up for the new jobs that are being created. So the, the, the institutions we have 
did pretty well in terms of what they were set up to do, but they no longer meet the challenges we've got. So we need to renew them. And of course, Beveridge was a product of his time. So, you know, he kind of made assumptions about women will be dependent on men. Workers will be dependent on bosses. Disabled people will be dependent on the state or their families. There was no engagement with racial injustice. So a lot of those issues were not really considered. And obviously in modern times, we need to rebuild our institutions so they can work for everyone. But what recommendations do you outline? So I think I mean, there's, there's quite a lot of different ones in there. I think a couple that I think maybe are most relevant for this. So one is thinking about the labour market. So I was saying you've got this basic problem of work just not doing enough to get people out of poverty. And one of the issues we have is about insecurity. So lots and lots of people, not just in zero hours contracts that we often think about, but also agency workers, people who are on short hours contracts, uh, people who are kind of cycling in and out of this kind of work. So one of the things I talk about is saying we actually do need a new employment bill that will bring in rights for workers at the bottom of the labour market. You know, so the right to a secure contract, to a contract that reflects the hours you actually work, the right to notice of your shifts, to being compensated if you've already paid for the childcare and the travel and then your shift gets cancelled. So actually having those rights would be, I think, good for everybody, but particularly good for people from black and minority ethnic groups who are disproportionately likely to be stuck in this kind of poor quality work, but also enforcing the rights we have. You know, we're terrible in this country at thinking about not just what more do we do, but how do we enforce it? So actually having a proper enforcement body that will make sure that people get the minimum wage, that they're treated fairly, that it isn't always up to individual workers to challenge the employer, which is basically how it works at the moment. So that's one set of things. I think something else within Social Security is thinking about saying we need a new public conversation about what it's for. And I think a heart of that needs to be a commitment that you know, we all make to each other, that if you are in need of Social Security, the amount you get will be enough for you to cover the essentials that you will get that basic level of support and it won't be reduced by debt repayments or sanctions or anything else, that actually it's just not right to leave people without the money to pay the bills and eat properly. And that's what's happening at the moment. I think if we did those two things, we could really change quite a lot for an awful lot of people out there. Although we could do two things to change a lot, but do you foresee the obstacles in front of you? Yeah, I mean, I think there are all sorts of obstacles. Um, I think partly actually at the moment, the sense of people feeling overwhelmed by what's happening. Um, so I think, you know, we've kind of had this period where we had a really difficult decade and then we had the pandemic and then we came straight out of the pandemic into a cost of living crisis and politics is just incredibly chaotic at the moment and everything feels very unstable. And I think that's something you can get that can turn into a sense of fatalism of the idea that everything's broken and you can't fix it. And that, I think, is probably the biggest barrier to change that we often face, because there are lots of solutions out there, but we do need to grasp them. And we need to not just think this is all completely messed up. We can't do anything about it. We've just got to live with it because, you know, we can absolutely change it. We can change it, but do you think the current prime minister is going to be the vehicle for change for minorities? I think it's been really interesting watching this debate about how important is it or isn't it that Rishi Sunak is the first British Asian prime minister. And the thing that's really struck me has been, you know, on the one hand, it can only be a good thing for people to see that those in positions of power can come from ethnic minority groups. You know, it's long overdue. But the other thing is the, how important it is to think about class as alongside ethnicity. So what I hear from a lot of people is that there are a lot more opportunities opening up for black and minority ethnic people who come from well-off, quite privileged backgrounds. And that is not at all the same for people from those groups who are coming from working class or less well-off backgrounds. So I think, I mean, going back to what Muna was saying, 
we need people around the table who have direct experience of the issues that are being tackled. So, you know, people to redesign social security needs to include people who've been on social security, who know what it's like. The same for every other issue. And I think so having that kind of diversity of economic background, as, along with diversity of ethnic background and gender and disability is really important. Well, it was wonderful to hear a breadth of experience and knowledge from my panelists um, on the question, no doubt, on minority communities and financial struggle. To my listeners, if you are interested in um, me doing a specific subject on Debt Talk podcast that you are interested in, you can get in touch with me, um, ripon.ray at yourdoctordebt.com. Also, you can find me on Twitter, Your Doctor Debt. The subject I have so far discussed with my panelists has been minority communities and financial struggle. To give a positive twist, no doubt, to this podcast, um, let me ask my panelists what top tips they can um, offer to my listeners when it comes to dealing with cost of living. So let me start with Patrick. Yeah, I think there's a number of things uh, that you can do. Um, I think uh, credit unions are still important. So, so I think I do encourage people to join a local credit union where they live. Uh, credit unions is a cheap way, an effective way of saving money against those unexpected bills or costs as well. When I was growing up as a in, when I was growing up as a child, my parents and it's, it still happens within the Caribbean community, it was called partner, where people would set aside money each week and then at, at the end of a cycle or if of a hand it was called, you would get money and people used to use that as a deposit to buy property, go on holiday, buy new furniture, buy a car. These Basic low cost ways of savings is one way to try and mitigate. I know it's very difficult for people because you may not have money to save, but in the good old days when there were, when there were piggy banks, saving 50p or a quid and just do it can accumulate quite a, quite a bit. So that's one way. I think there are lots of community organisations out there who are trying to encourage people to donate clothes, electrical goods, shoes. Uh, and you know, and if you've got anyone who's got excess stuff, donate that to charity shops or to closed banks or food banks. I mean, you know, we live in a very consumer-driven society, and you know, so I, every year what I do, I always go through what clo any clothes I'm not wearing, I always take it to the local charity shop. So I think we can do more of that kind of stuff on a practical level, and and also I think the final thing to add to that, if people are I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, I've heard about from Luna about if you've got really, you've got property debts and you're really, really struggling, don't be, don't suffer in silence. There are welfare rights, provisions, CABs, whole range of organisations that can help with you, can negotiate on your behalf with uh, creditors about your financial situation. It's good to talk sometimes and that might help you when you're in those difficult situations. Thanks for this, um, Patrick. Let's not suffer in silence. Let me now move to Muna. What are your top tips for the day? Thank you, Rafon. And just to follow on from Patrick's, I think my number one tip would be to seek advice and seek advice early. Um, you shouldn't suffer in silence, but more importantly, I know there's a stigma attached to uh, financial difficulties and financial worries and money and debt, but actually we're in a cost of living crisis and this is affecting um so many people so you shouldn't feel stigmatized and it is normal to seek advice so i would urge people to go to their local um debt advice organization if there are deeper issues around anxiety to speak to mind um samaritans um and also just talk about things the, the earlier you can talk about it the, the less burden that you have my second piece of advice would be to avoid high cost credit lenders so whatever you do, um, try and avoid anything that will add to your debt burden uh, going forward. If you do need to borrow, there are credit unions and CDFIs and affordable lenders. There are financial assistance schemes. Could you um, tell us what CDFI means? So community development finance institutions. So they're like community banks. Um, and they provide affordable uh, lending and, and, and responsible lending. 
So very similar to credit unions, but they probably lend to people that have a, a much riskier profile than credit unions. Um, and so think about if you do have credit needs, seeking advice and, and going on websites like Responsible Lending um, UK and um, Fair For All Finance to try and work out how you can borrow uh, smaller amounts more responsibly and are not exploited. And I think the last thing to say is that if people do need immediate access to food, um, do not avoid your food banks. I know people have um, some stigma around accessing food banks, but there are food banks that are now providing not only uh, food parcels, but there are ways that you can get fuel vouchers, you can get digital data vouchers. So there's lots of support out there. Just make sure that you speak to your local support agencies that can connect you to that support. And finally, to Helen, what tips do you give us? Um, so I would 100% agree with reaching out for support and not feeling that it's in some way failing. I actually, I heard from someone just a few days ago who was in a really difficult situation, wasn't eating properly, but didn't want to access support because they they just they felt ashamed. Mm -hmm. And there is so much shame bound up in this. Um, and I think just, you know, people feel very isolated, I think, and alone when they're in this situation. And actually, there are millions of people out there who are struggling and an awful lot of people don't claim the benefits they're entitled to. So one thing is, if you're struggling at all, there are websites like uh, Turn to Us is a great charity website where you can do a check to see if you uh, are entitled to benefits or support. They also have a grant finder thing. So for a lot of people, it's not just that it's hard to pay the bills, but your fridge breaks and you can't afford to get it fixed or get a new one. And that makes everything else worse. There are specific charities and local authority in some places schemes where you can get a grant that can help you get over that. And I think the other thing to remember is, I, you know, I see an awful lot of people who have reached out for support when time was really tough. And then when they feel they're back on their feet, they then give back themselves. They volunteer at a food bank or they support their community. And so these things go in cycles and actually helping each other is, you know, it's the right thing to do. So I would 100% say, make sure you're getting everything that you could be because it's there waiting. Look for grants if there are, you know, big things that it's hard to get to, which can lead you into debt. And also just think when you're feeling a bit better, you can give a bit back. And that's how we all get through this stuff. There we are. You can also give back. On that note, I would like to thank my panellists for giving up their precious time to speak to me on Debt Talk podcast. For my next podcast, um, I'm going to be speaking about Christmas alternative lending and recovery during the cost of living crisis. Once again, uh, thank you for listening to Debt Talk with me, your, your Dr. Debt, Ripon Ray. <laughs>